Thank you so much. Uh, our preaching series that we're currently doing is called Follow Me. So I wonder, maybe a question to start off with, who do you follow? Who do you follow? I could probably take a good guess, actually, how, uh, uh, who a number of you might follow. There's this guy who I heard of called uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Does anyone, anyone know who he is? Anyone follow him? Apparently one of the most followed people on, uh, well, he's the most followed person on social media. By my calculations, and I've not kind of finished asking everybody yet, it's like one in eight. One in eight people in the world follow Cristiano Ronaldo. One in eight. He's the most followed person on Instagram. And I was just thinking, why do people follow this guy? I was looking a little, finding out a little bit about him. I'm kind of behind the curve. I'm not, I haven't followed him yet. But, um... Oh, you might also follow Selena Gomez. Does that, that name mean anything to, to some? I'm sure it does. Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift. Look at me, knowing all the, all the cool people. <laughs> but anyway, Cristiano Ronaldo. I, I looked him up. He's apparently pretty good at football. So that's, that's kind of one reason why people follow him. His football skills, about 800 goals last year. Another reason people follow him is because he's pretty financially successful. He's uh, got a cool 136 million, I think, he made last year. So he's got a lot of money. He's fashionable, I think. He wears, he wears fashionable clothes. He's got his own fashion line, um, even. He's a fashionable guy. He's a, he's a good footballer. He's got financial success. He's fashionable. He's physically quite fit as well. He can run around. I don't know about you, but when you try and run around on a football pitch, you tend to get quite tired quite quickly. When I kind of just uh, run up the street, I get tired. This guy doesn't get tired when he runs up the street. He can run around for, what is it, 45 minutes? Two lots of 45 minutes. He can keep going. He's physically quite strong. He's quite a fit guy. We want, we want to be fit, don't we? So we kind of look to this guy. He's, he's fit. He's skillful. He's financially successful. He's fashionable. He wears the right clothes. And he's also fit. But he's also famous. There's just something about being famous that draws us to people. They're, if everybody else is following someone, think, well, perhaps there must be something good there, so we want to follow him as well. I'm sure one of the reasons that many, so many follow him is because so many follow him. It just kind of works like that. You wouldn't have heard of him if you hadn't kind of uh, got all these, these followers. So we kind of add him. This, I don't know if on Twitter, uh, it keeps suggesting that I follow these famous people. I don't know why, but they just kind of, they, they're, they're, they're popular, so probably we want to follow them too. Who do you follow? I wonder who you follow. We're all followers in one way or another. In the past, our aspirations and desires crystallized around, well, certainly in, in ancient secular societies, they crystallized, well, in, in, in not secular societies, in, they, in, in Greek society, in Roman society, they crystallized around a whole collection of gods who, who uh, you follow different ones, you kind of devote yourself to different ones, you worship different ones, and there were different particular key aspects of their life that you were attracted to. In our modern society, it tends to be around famous people who are good at different things, who embody certain aspirational desires that we have, and we follow them. And maybe you're not on Instagram, maybe you're not a social media person, but still the question remains, who do you admire? Who do you want to be like? Who is the source of perspective and information on this kind of strange and confusing world that we have? Who are you following to try and get insight and glimpses into, into the meaning of life? Who are you following? Into this crazy world of the blind following the blind comes Jesus. And he says boldly and clearly, follow me. Follow me. And of course, that's the title of our current series that we're going through, through reading through Mark's gospel. And Goff really helpfully introduced it last week, talking about the good news that is in this gospel, this account of Jesus' life. Jesus came into this world and he said, follow me. And we're just picking up and trying to understand something of the weight and significance of that and how that works out in our lives and how it works out in your life. So we're going to just continue reading on now in uh, chapter 1, verse 16. We'll just read about three verses. Just a very short passage this morning, but lots in there for us. So chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, starting in verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon, who he would later call Peter. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, 
and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Amazing passage and account here of what happened kind of 2,000 years ago. Jesus walking along by the Sea of Galilee and seeing Simon and Andrew and saying to them, follow me. There's three things I want to highlight for us this morning that I believe God wants to highlight for us this morning out of this really, really helpful passage. And the first is the call to follow Jesus. The call to follow Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. Commentators alert us to the fact that Jesus is doing something a little bit unusual there. Normally, people would ask to follow rabbis. You would kind of pick your rabbi, who you want to be apprenticed by. You would say, hey, I'd love to follow you. Can I follow you? Kind of like a, the private Instagram thing. We had to say, I'd like to follow you. And they have to say, yes, okay, you can follow me. Jesus is doing something different. He's taking the initiative. He's stepping into this world where everyone's trying to work out who to follow. And he's saying, follow me. I'm the one that you should be following. He took the initiative. He came into a world where we were following everything else but God. This is God incarnate coming into our world to call us to follow him, to call you to follow him. When we're following all kinds of other things, in fact, anything but God. Once we've stopped following God, we tend to fill that place with anything else. We turn away from him. We do our own thing. Paul says, the Apostle Paul, he says, do you know what? No one truly seeks God. We follow anybody and anything else but the one we should be following, God himself. And so here Jesus comes and he takes the initiative. He says, follow me. Left our own devices. We would would never have turned our eyes heavenwards. We would never have sought out God without his initiative, his enabling initiative in our lives. And so Jesus arrives on the scene and he says, follow me. And it's a call that's powerful and effective. We needed to hear that call. It's a call that wakes us from the dead. It's not, as we heard this morning, God's word doesn't just come to us saying, you should do better, you should do this, you should do that. It comes to us with the power to enable us to do that which God is calling us to do. And so here Jesus comes and he says, follow me. He speaks that out as God incarnate and it comes with the power of the Spirit to enable us to do just that. You can see something of that in the immediacy of Peter's response. Follow me. Of course, not everyone followed Jesus, but here, as Jesus says, follow me, something happened in Peter, something happened in the men there that he called, and immediately they followed him. This call is powerful and effective. But how come Jesus can call us back into relationship with God when we've gone so far away from him? Surely the things that we have done should disqualify us from from following a God who is holy and good and perfect, and yet we've done things that are are far from good, far from perfect. Well, Jesus can call us back into relationship with God because he took all the things that we did wrong. He took all our willful wanderings, all our sin, all, all our moral failures. He took them upon himself, and he paid for them on the cross. He was going to the cross So he's calling Peter here, knowing what he would do, knowing that that he would provide the means of Peter coming back into a wonderful relationship with God. He would deal with Peter's sin. He would deal with Peter's willful wandering away on the cross by dying and rising again. And so in the light of that, knowing where he was going, he's calling people to follow him. And Jesus invites us to follow him. It's kind of a, it's, I say it's, a, it's sort of an invite, but it's really a command. It is a command. It, it's something that we should do. This is, this is the God who created us. This is Jesus who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. This is Jesus through whom and for whom all things were made, including you and including me. This is something that we should rightfully do. When Jesus says, follow me, it is a command of a king. Follow me. But it is not the command of an oppressive dictator. It's not the command of someone who wants to dominate us and control us. God calls us through Jesus in this follow me as a loving father who cares about us, who cares about our lives. In fact, in the person of Jesus who's willing to die for our mistakes, for our sin, for the things that we have done wrong. So he comes to command us and call us and he's commanding you and he's calling you out of love and compassion to follow him this morning. Follow me. Wonderfully, he's speaking to Peter here, but through these words that have been breathed out by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is here, present right now, calling you, calling me to follow Jesus. Follow me. 
It's the voice of our king staring in you. It's the voice of our king that is prompting you, that is provocating you this morning. It's the pull of the Holy Spirit back into a relationship with God. Follow me. But the thing about following is that you've got to leave something else. To follow Jesus, you've got to leave other things that you're following. You can't just collect a whole bunch of things. Jesus doesn't call us like that. And uh, it says here, amazingly, immediately they followed Jesus. They left their nets to follow Jesus. In order to follow Jesus, we need to leave other things. And there will inevitably be things in our lives that we need to put down if we're to truly follow Jesus. We can't have two masters. Jesus invited a rich young ruler to follow him. He said to this young man, leave your money and follow me. Leave your money and follow me. It's the most extraordinary thing because this young man goes away sad. He can't do it. You think, why, why would you go away sad? Why, if you cared, would you go away sad? And I think part of the answer is he's trying to include Jesus in this portfolio that he's building. I've got, got riches. I've got popularity. I've got leadership. I've got responsibility. I've got good social standing. I want to add now to that a good moral teacher, a spiritual guru, a religion. I want to add to my collection of things that I have. And Jesus says it doesn't work like that. You follow me and me only. And everything else is subservient to that. He couldn't do it. He went away sad. He was collecting a whole load of things. Jesus says, you, you follow me and you leave everything else behind. Everything else is in the context of following me. You can't follow Jesus half-heartedly. You can't follow Jesus a little bit. It's all or nothing. Follow me. Not as another good thing, Jesus is saying. When he's calling to Peter, he's not saying, follow me as another good thing. Add me, add me to your, your career ambitions. Add me to your, all the, your bucket list. You can't add Jesus to your bucket list. He's the entirety of it. Everything that we have is contained in him. Everything good is in him. You can't have Jesus and. He says, follow me, not as another good thing, but as the only true God. Love him with your whole heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And everything else is put in context of that first and great love. But don't get confused. It's easy to get confused with this. Salvation is free. Forgiveness is free. Eternal life is free. God's love for you is free. His blessing on you is free. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. This is not an exchange that's going on. Well, if I do this for God, he will love me. He will forgive me. He will bless me. That's not how it works. However, to follow Jesus, you will have to put down some things. You will have to leave some things. Peter left his nets. Actually, I'll Oh, this is a long time ago. My illustrations are getting, as I'm getting older, my illustrations are getting a little bit, a little bit older. But um, does anyone remember like a TV show where there was children, and I'm sure I didn't dream this, and they, they had to answer like quiz questions. And if you got a quiz, quiz question right, you got a toy that you could hold. And if you get a quiz question, a quiz question wrong, you got a cabbage. Do you remember that? Cracker Jack, that's it, Cracker Jack. So you had this kind of, all these kids were like standing there in, the, in this room with these piles of presents. And if you get a question wrong, you get a cabbage. And of course, the, the problem is, the more cabbages that you have, the less space that you have in your arms to carry all the good things that you could have. And it's a, it's a little bit like that. It's not completely, but it's, can you see, it's a little bit like that. You, you, if there are some good things that God wants to give you, you, you can't keep hold of the cabbages. It just, it just doesn't work. You're not going to have space for all the good things that God wants to lead you in and give you in the person of Jesus. Gonna, they weren't allowed to put down their cabbages. As soon as they drop something, that's, that's it, you're out. But Jesus, when he calls us to follow him, he says, put down your cabbage. You know, there's, there's the ca I thought about stopping off at Aldi this morning to get a cabbage. I probably would have made it a little bit more powerful, wouldn't it? There's another one I, th I thought of, and uh, this, this might not be real either. Um, 
Is it true that you catch monkeys um, by putting peanuts in a jar, in a little mason jar? Is that right? Do you, oh, so, you know, I've got this kind of brain that um, if, 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 if you try and teach it something valuable, like uh, French vocabulary or something, it's like, oh, what's, what's that, sir? No, no, I d- didn't hear that. Sorry, oh, Johnny's kicking me. I'm not on the back of my chair. Just can't get my brain to learn really useful things. But the, the moment you mention something about monkeys and catching monkeys, oh, what's, what's that? <laughs> something about monkeys? How, yeah, how'd you catch my, Let me get a pen. How's that? How'd you catch, how many peanuts? What kind of size does the diameter of the jar need to be for the monkey to catch? How many monkeys can you catch? What do you do with the monkeys when you catch them? Suddenly I'm all ears. So I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think if you want to catch monkeys, you put peanuts in a jar. Or is, or is it something to do? You know, I'll, I'll tell you the whole story afterwards, but... It's in my head. Regardless of whether that's true or not, you can see for the purposes of my illustration what's going on. Because the monkey puts his hand in the jar and takes hold of the peanuts, and he can't get them out again. And so along, along comes you to, uh, to capture the monkey for some purpose or other. I don't, know what, I don't know why you're trying. Anyway, why would that be helpful? But um, actually, I know why it would be helpful, but I'll tell you later. <laughs> and the, and uh, the, the, the monkey won't let go. He won't let go of the peanuts. Peanuts, it's peanuts. It's peanuts, nothing. It's not, not important. He won't let go of it. If we're to follow Jesus, if you're to follow Jesus, there are going to be some things. There are going to be some cabbages you're going to need to put down. There are going to be, need to be some peanuts you need to let go of if you're going to come into and follow Jesus in, term, in the good things that he has for you. You can't follow Jesus and something else at the same time. I remember when I was called to follow Jesus, there were a whole lot in my things in my life that were not compatible with following Jesus. A lot of them were, were physical things. And I remember a friend coming around to my house and we, we filled up huge boxes full of all this stuff that was in my life that shouldn't have been there, that I couldn't take into following a life with Jesus. And we took it to the skip and we put it all in there. Be different things for different ones of us. Is there were, that was the easy part, to be honest. That was easy. But there are other things. There were attitudes and thoughts and, uh, and habits in my life that were harder to kick. But it was a kind of a visual picture of, of we, we had to put things down to follow Jesus. We have to put things in the skip to follow Jesus. That was the start of my Christian life. I'm sure it'll be the same for you. There are things you have to leave behind. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's habits. Sometimes it's ways of doing things. A whole life then following Jesus be- becomes a process of, of taking off the old and putting on the new. You've got to take, you, you can't put a new pair of shoes on without taking off the old pair of shoes. It doesn't work. There are things in following Jesus we need to take off. We need to stop doing and stop thinking like that. Stop engaging in that activity, whatever it is. Sometimes it's physical things we need to kind of burn and uh, uh, give up. I remember a little bit later on as I kind of uh, grew as a Christian, the Lord called me into full-time leadership in the church, full-time serving, working in the church. And, and that's been a real blessing. It's just, it's been a wonderful thing, wonderful part of my, of my life. But at the time, I had to put something else down in order to do it. I had to, my, my career that I loved and that I trained for and that I, was, I dreamed of as a young boy, suddenly that became a cabbage. What am I going to do? Follow Jesus into the new things that he has for me, the good things that he has for me, or I'm going to keep hold of the peanuts, I'm going to keep hold of the, the cabbage. It can be different things for different ones of us at different times, but we need to understand when this call comes to us, follow me, this empowering call, the spirit starts to move in us, and we've got a choice to make. Do I follow Jesus, or do I keep hold of those things, even good things often that the Lord gave me before? Now, now there's a fresh call. Do I follow Jesus into the good things that he has for me. There's always something we need to put down in following Jesus. Peter put down his nets. Later on, he were to, he, if, we're to, if we're to kind of uh, uh, understand church history and the, and the, the evidence, it, it looks like he laid down his life. He gave up his life for Jesus. He laid it down. It be, even his very physical life had become a cabbage to him as Jesus called him to be with him, to follow him. And of course, anything we lay down for Jesus, Jesus promises, you'll get it back a hundred times. But trust me in this. Trust me in this. As you, as you make this swap, as you follow me and put down that, trust me that I am the way and the truth and the life and that you won't be worse off. Don't measure things just by this life that we have, this, this age that we have now. There is an age to come and the glory 
that we will experience then and we will see then will not be worth comparing to the challenge and the difficulties and the things that we put down right now. If you, if you, if you try and keep hold of your life, you will lose it. Guaranteed. If you lay your life down for Jesus in following him, you'll have eternal life. And no one will be able to take that away from you. This is the call that Jesus has when he says, follow me. This empowering call is to leave the lesser and take hold of that which is of infinite worth in him. And so finally, the task that he gives us, the task to fish. We've had the call to follow, the need to leave, and now the task to fish. So he's left his nets. Now what does he do? What, is, what does life look like? What is the new paradigm that he is living out? What does it look like in his life? In practice, where Jesus says, I will make you become fishers of men. I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus is calling Peter to be part of his putting all things right. He's calling Peter into the privilege of being part of God, calling men and women back into relationship with him. This is the most important thing that is taking place on the earth right now. It's, it's, it's the most significant thing. It's the most eternal thing. It's this call, follow me. And Jesus is saying to Peter, I'm calling you to follow me, and I want you to extend this call to others. I want this call to go out through the whole earth and I'm going to need you and others and those that respond through you and those that respond through you and through them to issue this call on our universities and our campuses and our schools and our colleges, along our streets. Follow me. This call to follow Jesus. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. It's a wonderfully rich description, which probably would have meant more to Peter than it would to us. And obviously, we've got some idea of what it means to fish and uh, well, I mean, obvi- I mean, we'll unpack a little bit of it. We'll brainstorm in a minute what that means to fish. But obviously, it doesn't mean that people are swimming around underwater. Obviously, it doesn't mean um, that, that people are a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. You, kind of, you often know instinctively how not to apply an analogy. So, but how are we to apply this analogy? What would, what would have been uh, of meaningful content in Peter's head when he understood this expression? I'm going to make you fishers of men. What you've been doing physically with these... Uh, this fishing business that you've got, I'm going to now put in this, 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 this eternal context of the most important mission and activity that you could possibly be involved in. So let's brainstorm a bit. The first is you need to go where the fish are. Peter knew that you didn't fish on land. You need to go to where the fish are. I remember I was trying to fish once, and uh, it suddenly dawned on me, that I wasn't really fishing, I was just standing. Because there were no fish around. There were no fish for miles around. We, 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 we were near the sea, but in fact we were, yeah, we were, we were near the sea. But there were no fish. I'm sure there were no fish. You know, apparently the seagulls come down and you can, you can see where the fish are. There were no seagulls for miles around. There were no fish. I was just standing. I need to go where the fish are. And actually, Andy and I hatched a plan to... Um, I said, look, you know, if, if I'm to go out again, I need a radar on a boat, and I need to know that there are fish there, and I need to be right, right on top of them. And I, Where are the fish? We need to go where the fish are. If you're going to fish, you need to go where the fish are. Jesus, of course, came. He was incarnate to go where we are. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee, but actually he's left heaven. He's left glory with his Father to come and to be in the kind of the mess and the muck of where we are. Because he loves us, because he cares about us. He came to call us, but he came to where you are at to call you. Maybe some can remember where you were when you had that call, follow me. I remember when I was actually again at university, this call came through a, a friend, through a, a lab partner to follow Jesus. I was stirred, something came alive in me, and I responded and I followed Jesus. Jesus comes to call He comes to where people are, and he sends us out. He sends you out. He sends Peter out to go where the people are. If you're going to be a fisher of men or of women, you need to go where they are. Otherwise, you're just standing. Secondly, to catch fish, you need to do something. You need to cast the net out. They would have fished with nets in those days, I think. Jesus casts this net out by what he does and what he says. One of the most extraordinary, challenging things he did was he supernaturally healed people. And that's a challenge to me. It's a challenge to us to keep casting that net out. 
believing that the God cares about people and works supernaturally, and to pray again, to offer to pray, to believe God that he's, he does heal supernaturally. Je- that's one of the key ways that Jesus cast this net out. He prayed for people, they got well. He commanded people and they got well. He's casting this net out. But of course, we can help people in all kinds of ways. We can express God's love in all kinds of different ways. And as we do that, we're casting this net out. But we also need to articulate the gospel, the good news. This is supremely the way that we cast this net out, to share the gospel, even kind of timidly. And, uh, and perhaps some of us feel like we're often fishing with broken nets, and I can't really articulate it very well, and that came across rather clumsily. I remember once sharing with a colleague, just inviting them to Alpha. We had an Alpha here. And I was saying, oh, would you like to come to Alpha? I mean, it took weeks to pluck up the courage. And they said, no, no, I don't want to go. I said, oh, no. But then it led to a conversation with somebody else at, at the next desk who said, oh, I'd like to come along. I'm like, wow, how, how did that happen? I'm just, all I'm doing is you're casting a net out. It's, you don't know specifically what is going on in people's hearts, but you cast the net out. And it's a powerful and effective net, and you'll be surprised who will respond We need to trust the process. Peter knew that you cast the net out into the water, but you can't see what's under there. He didn't have a, he he knew the fish were about, but he didn't, he didn't know what he was going to catch. And often he would pull the net up and maybe there's nothing in there, but often he would be surprised that the fish that are in there. We need to trust the process, that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. And so we cast this net out of this good news that we've been hearing about, that is, follow Jesus. He, he's the Lord of life. He died for you so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be brought back into a relationship with God. You were created through him, for him. This is the meaning and purpose of your life. Death is not the end. It's not, it's not winking out of existence. You're eternal. You need to be plugged into the source of eternal life. Come and follow Jesus. God loves you so, so much. He died for you. He rose again so that you could have life. We need to articulate these things, share these things, I mean, imperfectly in different ways and exemplify them by the way we live and the transformation that's coming in our lives as well. But we need to cast this net out and trust the process, trust the power of the gospel to do its job. Without God's empowering, enabling, no one would respond to the gospel. It's not about our words. It's not about our cleverness. It's not about our charisma, our, our personality. It's about the power of the gospel. And as we cast it out in this city and beyond, we'll be amazed at who God will draw to himself through it. We have to keep going. Peter knew that sometimes he didn't catch anything. Sometimes you go out in the boat and you get nothing. But you go again the next day. You go again the next day. He persevered as a fisherman. And maybe that's an encouragement and a, an exhortation to some of us to go again. Go again with the gospel. Cast the net out again with the gospel. Keep going. Sometimes he caught nothing. And sometimes the net was so full. It was straining. It was, it was straining at the, the seams, the, the string. It was straining at the string. Uh, full of fish. Wouldn't that be glorious? Oh, Lord, would you bring us into a time where the nets are just our bursting point. Lord, that you'd fill this place with men and women who are hungry for you, are passionate for you, who are in love with you. Lord, thank you for this effective calling. Lord, we trust in your calling, not in our cleverness, not in our words, but in your power. Let's keep going. Let's keep extending this invitation, even when people don't always seem keen at first uh, glance. Just a couple more. Peter knew that it, to fish successfully, you need to be part of a team. He, he, it wasn't just one person going out with a fishing rod. It was a team of people on the boat, and they worked together in different ways. And that's the glorious thing about the church, the body of Christ, that different ones of us have different skills and abilities and insights. He positions us in different ways, and we work together to cast the net out, to proclaim the gospel, to care and to serve our city. There's a richness as we do it together. We can't do it all, all on ourselves. We're not all called to be a Billy Graham type person. And even Billy Graham, actually, look behind the scenes. He was a famous evangelist, by the way. And uh, he, he had huge teams behind him of people doing all kinds of different things that this net could be cast out. And so it is with each one of us. We don't, don't think you're not part of it. Don't think God hasn't equipped you or gifted you to be part of this, this glorious team, this body that is calling men and women to follow 
Jesus. We need your part. Your part is essential. If you're part of the church here, it's essential. It's indispensable. The gifts and abilities and insights that you bring to be part of this wonderful family that is inviting others to follow Jesus. And finally, it's dangerous work. And there are storms, aren't there, when you go fishing out in, a, out in the boats. There were storms on the Sea of Galilee. But at one point, they feared for their lives, the, dis- the disciples. It's not easy, and it's sometimes a little bit scary, and it feels a bit, a bit risky. But this is the most important thing that you can ever be called to do. There's no greater task to invest your life with than calling people into an eternal, joyful relationship with God through the gospel. And everything else in our lives comes under that wonderful uh, umbrella and is an expression of that in different ways. I wonder if the band would like to come back. I'm going to throw the net out right now. We're, we're in a moment, we're going to come back into worship, but uh, we want to pray for one another. We, we can't do this without one another. I want to pray for you if God is stirring you about following Jesus. Now, that might be following Jesus for the first time. That might be, you know, the Bible tells us, as we read other accounts, that this wasn't the first time Peter had encountered Jesus. It wasn't this stranger that was just appearing. He knew something about Jesus. I think it was his brother had introduced him to, or one of his friends introduced him to Jesus. And he may have even spent an evening with, with Jesus. He knew a little bit about Jesus. And maybe you've been finding out a little bit about Jesus. Maybe you know a little bit about Jesus. But there was a moment and there was a time when Jesus called Peter to follow him. And there was an immediacy about his response to that. Now was the, mo- was the moment. Now was the point, at which of de- the point of decision. Would he follow Jesus or wouldn't he follow Jesus? Would he carry on with his life as it was or would he now walk into this new life? Would he push through that door that we've heard about into this wonderfully new life with Jesus. Maybe it's a moment of decision for you right now. Will you follow Jesus for the first time? In a moment, as, we, uh, as many of us will come and pray for one another, I, w- I want you to come straight away in a moment, and we would love to stand with you and to pray that through with you. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while. Maybe you've made that kind of once-for-all decision to follow Jesus, but as you follow him, there are choices that we face in life. There are decisions. Jesus will call you. Will will you follow me away from that thing? Maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a bad thing. But for now, it's become for you a cabbage. Maybe you're facing a difficult, challenging decision in following Jesus. And you're kind of weighing that up. I want to encourage you. Follow Jesus. Now is the moment of decision. And we would love to pray for you. Not that you would make that decision. Of course, we can do that. I want to pray for you as you make that decision as you make that decision, and you coming and standing here and saying, I would, would you pray for me for the power of God as I make that decision? You've heard the call. There's power in the call. Now we want to pray for you as you make that decision. Will you, will you leave whatever it is and follow Jesus? Will you make that difficult decision for Jesus? We'd love to pray for you. And finally, I want to pray for you if you've had a fresh calling and a stirring to follow Jesus as a, fishers, a fisher of men as a fisher of women, as a fisher of others that don't know Jesus. We want to pray for you, for the Spirit of God to be on you, and he will so come to you and strengthen you and empower you. If you're saying, do you know what, I just, I've, uh, I, I want a fresh boldness, I want a, I want a fresh uh, zeal in my sharing, in my calling people to follow you, we would love to pray for you. Why don't we stand together? I'm going to pray for all of us, and then if you would like prayer to follow Jesus, for the first time, to leave a cabbage, to leave the peanuts, to take hold of that which is real, eternal, substantial in the person of Jesus, we'd love to pray for you. And we would love to pray for you, for the Spirit of God to be on you, so that you would be empowered to be fishers of men, to be fishers of women. Jesus said, wait, wait, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The power of God will come on you and you'll be my witnesses. Father, we thank you for this call. Thank you for sending your son into the world. Thank you for sending your son into the world where we are. Lord, we, we, we wouldn't have known, we wouldn't have heard, but you sent Jesus. 
And we heard this call, many of us, follow me. And it awoke something in us. We came to new life and we followed you, Lord Jesus. And we, we don't regret a moment of it. And I pray, Lord Jesus, right now for your spirit to be here, Lord, that you would be making this, this wonderful call effective and powerful in, in our lives. Lord, that there be those here this morning that would follow you for the very first time. Even now, hearing this tug, hearing this kind of this, it's almost like a, a chick kind of breaking out of a shell. There's new spiritual life that is coming to birth in you. Follow Jesus. Come to him. Lord, I pray those that are right now wrestling with that decision, do I leave that behind and follow Jesus? It's going to be difficult. They don't know whether to let go of the peanuts and pull their hand out of the mason jar. They don't know whether to let go of the cabbage. Lord, would you come right now in Jesus' name with the power of the gospel to free us from these things. They have become chains. As soon as you say, follow me, and we keep hold of the peanuts, it's a chain. It's a chain. It's a trap. Lord, I pray, free, free us from the, the traps that hold us, that stop us following you right now in Jesus' name. In the Jesus' name, be free. In the Jesus' name, be free to follow him. And Lord, I thank you that you wonderfully, powerfully equip us to follow you. Lord, I pray you would freshly anoint fishers of men and fishers of women this morning to be powerful and effective as we cast this net out together in Jesus' name. If you would like prayer, now is the opportunity. Now is the time. Come and join us, me and the team over there. And we will we'll ask you, perhaps, which one of those you want, us, you want to respond to. And then we will gladly, with great love and joy in our hearts, pray for the power of God to be on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and join me.